Hi and welcome to Biotech's specialist webinar. My name is Lauri. I'm the marketing and sales director here at Biotech. In today's specialist webinar, we focus on talar fractures, comminuted talar body fractures. The implant that we are focusing now is Activa nail, similar to Activa pin, but with the conical nail head. Gives a little bit more pressure to the area. Our guest speaker today comes from London, UK, Mr. Ziad Harp. He has done cases with this technique, with this very difficult uh, indication. Warmly welcome, Mr. Harp. Hi, Larry. Good evening. How are you? Thank you very much. We are very, very well, well here in Finland. Hope that everything's okay in London. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Hey, without further ado, let's move forward to the uh, comminuted taller body fracture reconstruction. Mr. Hobb, your the stage is, is yours. Thank you, Larry. So, um, to begin with, I just wanted to briefly talk about Taylor body fractures in general. They are extremely rare. Um, they present about less than 1% of all fractures and perhaps 10 to 20 percent of Taylor's fractures themselves. They are um, usually related to high energy trauma, often from falls from heights or, as this picture depicts, falls from a horse. Uh, the actual mechanism is thought to be axial loading, often in combination with either supination or pronation. And by their nature, being high energy, there's often other fractures related to it, ankle fractures, tibial, spine fractures, and so on. Now, we're all familiar with the Taylor neck classification, and that often comes up in discussions. And being more common, Taylor necks have uh, perhaps uh, had the limelight a bit more than Taylor body fractures. And we're familiar with the Hawkins classification, which does help, and it predicts prognosis and so on. As for Taylor body fractures, there are a couple of classification systems. However, they are not thought to be very helpful, certainly in the prognosis or in helping decide treatment options. So, for example, there's a Snepen classification, uh, which again, is largely academic and useful for describing the types and the patterns. However, in general, they don't really help as uh, as we'd like them to and certainly they, there's no correlation with prognosis so therefore there's less focus on the classification now what's more important i think is the outcomes and the complications um, post-traumatic osteoarthritis of the ankle joint and the subtalar joint is extremely common and i'll come on to that in a second and talk a bit more detail Malunion and non-union, not so common, and typically in the region of you know, five to 8%. Um, and this is related to the intraoperative reduction or malreduction. Um, avascular necrosis, very, very important. Again, um, the risk of this, typically in a Taylor body fracture, can vary between 50 to 75% in the majority of the studies that have looked at this. So this is really, really important. And probably the most important factor related to avascular necrosis is the initial displacement. So the more displacement, the more traumatic the injury is, the higher the rate of avascular necrosis. And this would make sense because of the blood supply being disrupted. What's important with AVN is that the timing of surgery is not thought to affect uh, the AVN rate. So there's no rush and these cases can be uh, planned and can be uh, left for a while, particularly with the soft tissue element of these fractures where often we are waiting for the swelling, the blisters and so on to, to improve before we uh, intervene with surgery. Infection is important. Um, Typically, there is about 25% risk of a Taylor body fracture associated with an open fracture. So already there's a higher risk of infection. And again, because of the 
nature of the fracture and the risk of multiple operations, there's that added risk of infection. So that's something to bear in mind. Now, in terms of post-traumatic osteoarthritis, this is something that is really, really important. And the uh, studies that have looked at this, they're all small case series, you know, 20 to 30 cases in each study have varied. And there are some quoting up to 100% risk of post-traumatic osteoarthritis, either the ankle, subtalar, or both joints. Now, the reason I wanted to focus on this, this helps me decide how to attack and how to plan my surgery. If I know there's going to be a high risk of osteoarthritis at some point down the line following the injury, then I need to have options in order to plan further surgery. Now, if you see the x-rays uh, I've put at the bottom right, that uh, fracture has been fixed very nicely with plates and screws, and I think they've done a medium malleolar osteotomy. Great. Now, if it develops osteoarthritis, there's already the added risk of further surgery to remove the metal work from the talus. And if by putting it in, you required a medial malleolar osteotomy, this is another potential risk that you may have to go in and perform the osteotomy yet again with risks of further damage to the soft tissues and so on. So if we know there's a high risk of post-traumatic arthritis, and if we know that we are likely to come back and have more surgery, then I think it's very useful to plan ahead. And what can we use that will eliminate potential extra steps in the future? And I think this is where the bioabsorbable pins and uh, nails come into their own because they will eliminate the extra step. And I'll talk about that later on. But this is one of the main reasons, I guess, one of the indications to try and eliminate the extra traumatic approach and invasiveness of, uh, of removal of the implants. So I'd like to talk about a case now. Um, this is a, a young lady, 17 year old, who's fit and healthy. She fell from a horse and sustained a closed Taylor body fracture and associated lateral malleolar fracture. The foot was neurovascularly intact and she was transferred from a nearby hospital to our unit being a tertiary referral center for complex trauma. These are the initial radiographs and you can see immediately that there is a disruption to the distal fibula and the talus doesn't look quite right. Now, it's very important to get further imaging with Taylor body fractures and Taylor neck fractures because plain radiographs do occasionally underplay and under report, shall we say, the true nature. And some studies have shown only up to 70% picking up Taylor body fractures. Here's a, a, a CT scan showing the Taylor body fracture comminution. And you can see how it's disrupted in multiple planes. And there's a axial loading element and you can see the amount of communication in the, in, the, in the Taylor body involving the talus and involving the joints above and below. This is the coronal view now and you can again this helps demonstrate the amount of communication and the multiplanar nature of the fracture. So here we are. This is what uh, we were faced with, um, a fit and healthy 17-year-old and quite a, uh, you know, a nasty fracture of the talus. So what's the plan? Well, obviously, the first thing is to allow the soft tissues to wait. The joints are not dislocated or subluxed. It was reasonable in a plaster, and therefore we waited for the soft tissues to settle. We allowed uh, elevation, strong analgesia, and careful monitoring. And at around 10 days post the injury, I think the soft tissues were good enough that we could start to plan the date of surgery. The next thing to think about is 
how to access the Taylor body fracture. Now, the talus in general can be accessed from the standard anteromedial and anterolateral approaches for Taylor neck fractures, and most people are common uh, are familiar with those. There are other approaches, posterolateral, postromedial, and of course via osteotomies. Um, so it's important to think about how to plan the operation. And I think this is probably the most important thing in Taylor body fractures, to take your time and to plan it well and to have all the options available. So having waited for the soft tissues and decided on my approach, now you'll remember from her case, the distal fibula is fractured at the same level as the talus, which gave me access to the lateral side, excellent. On the medial side, I had to um, think about how to access the Taylor body, in particular the posterior process. So I did that via medial malleolar osteotomy. Fixation techniques, and this is something I mentioned earlier. I wanted to eliminate, if possible, the added trauma of having to come back and remove whatever metal work is left in, or whatever implant is left in, in this young patient. So therefore, I decided to go with the um, uh, Activa nails. And this is, again, planning ahead. She is likely to need further uh, input and further uh, surgery, perhaps, down the line. So therefore, it's important to try and plan that extra step. So we have a plan, and this is my access. So from the lateral side, a typical distal fibula approach, uh, and uh, on the medial side, uh, via a medial malleolar osteotomy. And this gave us fantastic views. I found this extremely useful, and I, I'd encourage people uh, to consider using this um, when performing Taylor body fracture surgery. This is a femoral distractor. And again, this helped to really disimpact the area and uh, again, gave us excellent views. And as I mentioned, I opted to use the Activa nails and I used the, the 1.5 Activa nail. And I found this extremely useful in holding the fractures. And remember, I, I didn't really want any compression as such because the reduction was performed manually under direct vision. I held them temporarily with K wires and then I inserted the Activa nail remove the K-wire and the position was well maintained. Now these screws are, these uh, nails rather, are fantastic at holding. I don't think they particularly add a lot in terms of compression, and that's perhaps where the screw would come in. Um, but these particular active, Activa nails are good at just maintaining the position that you've got. So in terms of the sequence, um, initially, I performed the medium malleolar osteotomy uh, in the standard technique, pre-drilling for the screws and avoiding going into the plafond itself. You will see here the um, distraction uh, via the femoral distractor and the K wires used initially for the temporary hold before the insertion of the Activa nails. And you can already start to see that the talus is starting to say, take shape. And this was all done under direct vision putting the pieces together very carefully and paying really close attention to the soft tissues. There's been a lot of trauma to the area. The blood supply would have been perhaps not fully compromised, but under, uh, under tension. And it's important to maintain that soft tissue handling, particularly when you perform the medium malleolar osteotomy, that deltoid uh, blood supply is it's, it's crucial. And at the end, I fixed the medial and lateral uh, malleoli malleoli with the uh, standard uh, technique. And this is the lateral, lateral view, and you can see that the dome has been reconstructed, and you can see the subtalar joint looking well. So here we are. This is at the end of the operation, and it looked fine. In terms of the uh, Activa nail placement, it depends on the fracture pattern, of course. 
And this is a rough approximation of, of where they went. I used four or five, I think, the Activa nails. And it's important to try and put them perpendicular to the surface um, because of the slightly prominent head as opposed to the pins. So this is a rough approximation and they come in different lengths, of course. At three months following the removal of the cast uh, and the uh, subsequent boot, these are her radiographs. And I think it looked okay at this stage. It's still too early to comment at that time about long-term outcomes, of course, but at least the medial and lateral malleolar fractures have, have healed, the osteotomy is healed. And now it's a matter of waiting to see what will happen to that talus. But at least at this very early stage, it's, it looks like a talus and it's maintaining that, uh, that shape. So this is at three months and she was gingerly walking, able to walk and able to weight bear. And some encouraging signs at this early stage. At one year, so during that period, she went off and had some physiotherapy and um, started to get back uh, back to work and so on. And and this is the uh, this is the radiograph at one year. And I was um, quite happy with this in, in terms of the overall shape. The dome is well maintained. You can see there's nice clear. Uh, ankle joint and a subtalar joint. And going from something like this, which is a bit of a horror show to begin with, to that, uh, that AP at one year, and similarly with that lateral view, I, I was encouraged with these early results. And functionally, she was doing well and again she had gone back to work um, and she'd gone back on horse riding as well so that was not something I was particularly pleased to see but uh, there we are she was starting to get her life back on track reasonable range of motion as well and she had a little bit of uh, anterior ankle pain but um, this was something that uh, wasn't really Im impacting her at all, and she was managing extremely well. And again, you can see her range of motion and her strength at one year. So she's doing, she's doing okay. I do have another case to quickly uh, talk about. Um, Again, sadly, from horse uh, horse uh, riding and, and falling off a horse, this is a slightly older lady, 51-year-old. Again, isolated injury and closed and neurovascularly intact. Radiographs are a lot uh, more dramatic, shall we say. There is a shear element uh, which has been shown to be a bad prognostic factor, as well as the compression. If there's a shear element to the fracture, they tend to do a lot worse. And you'll see also that the joint is subluxed. Again, a bad prognostic factor. And here she had a medial and a lateral malleolar fracture, as well as the Taylor body. And there you can see the joint dislocated and the amount of trauma to the area. So this posed a slightly more challenging case um, because the initial amount of trauma would be the most important factor in predicting outcomes. This was a bad start. So whatever else we can do, this is really a bad start for her. And as we saw from those studies earlier, the risk of post-traumatic osteoarthritis and AVM are significant. And this is something that obviously would be discussed with the patient from the outset to clarify outcomes and, uh, and, and allow her to, to understand the nature of the injury. Very similar approach. Again, use a distractor, uh, used temporary K wires and um, reconstructed it and used, again, the same Activa nails. So this is her, it's just under one year. Um, You'll notice with both cases, um, they had 
symptomatic uh, hardware from the fibula plate in particular. Uh, both were fairly uh, skinny patients and they could feel the, the fibula plate and, and that had to be removed. However, no further trauma and no further uh, invasive uh, procedure was performed to take anything out of the talus because obviously we use the bioabsorbable uh, implants. At one, at less, just under one year, I think she was doing clinically well, radiographically perhaps not as well as the previous case, but given the nature of where we started and the fact that this was a much more traumatic injury, we have achieved good overall alignment. And if she needs any further in input, surgery, fusion, etc., then I think we're on a blank sheet, so to speak, and we can address it as per anyone else. And we're not having to go back in to perform, you know, malleoli osteotomies to try and uh, uh, remove the uh, internal hardware. So that's the advantage. That's the main advantage in these two cases. And again, good overall alignment, um, no major uh, deformities. And again, she had pretty reasonable strength. And she was able to, uh, Sadly, again, she was able to <laughs> go back to horse riding. So it's one of those things. So I think in summary, I think we have to appreciate that this type of injury is related with almost inevitable further surgery, whether it's removal of implants, whether it's uh, fusions, ankle replacements, and so on. Because of the risk of post-traumatic arthritis, and the risk of AVN, I think it's important to realize that fixing the Taylor body, it's not the end of the story. And therefore, if we can use anything to eliminate further uh, invasive procedures to try and re remove the implant, and then that's obviously a, a, a big positive. And again, we're trying to protect and handle the soft tissues and the blood supply with extra care, knowing how precarious it is in the talus. So far, with a couple of cases that I've shown, good results, good early results. Um, it's only been a year or so, so I think it's very important to follow up these cases for a little bit longer uh, before we uh, have uh, long-term long follow-ups. And finally, I'd say, try and avoid horse riding. Anyway, thank you very much. and. Um, I welcome your questions. Thank you very much. Lowry. Thank you, Mr. Harp. Thank you for the presentation. Excellent view on how these difficult surgeries can be done with biopsible implants with locations that are hard to reach and uh, yeah. excellent, excellent, excellent things. After Thank the you. presentation, now let's take a short view on how to actually insert the Activa nail what the instruments are involved in that. So let's uh, now play the next clip about the insertion of the implant.
Okay, so now we got the idea how the Activa nail is inserted. And let's go check the questions that we have received to our email address sales at bioretech.com. So first question, Mr. Harb. Do you believe that you disturb less talus blood supply by using Activa implants and avoid the vascular necrosis? So, uh, good question. I think it's not so much the disruption because we know the outcomes are related to the uh, amount of displacement on the initial injury. I think using a smaller implant like the 1.5 Activa nails is perhaps related to less trauma to the bone and also, more importantly, we are dealing with quite small fractures. So, if you think about putting a 3.5 screw in there, Obviously, there'll be a little, little bit more damage to the articular surface and so on. And I quite like the fact that they are small, 1.5, and it gives you a little bit more flexibility where to put them. Um, so I think with AVN, with avascular necrosis, I think the, the initial trauma and the initial amount of displacement, that's the key thing. And obviously, intraoperatively, anatomic reduction is essential, rigid fixation, and early range of motion. So these are the key things. But with AVN, I think the, the, the cast is set really, uh, depending on the amount of trauma and damage that happened at the very beginning. Perfect, thank you. Second question, uh, uh, do you see any advantage of such biopsorbable implant in contrast to titanium regarding necrosis of the talus, but which didn't happen in, in, in this case? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, um, well, one of the main reasons I preferred to use these absorbable pins and, and nails is that I really didn't want to come back at some point in the future and perform further osteotomies and quite an invasive procedure to simply take out the implants. We have here a case that once you put them in, they've done their work, the fracture's gone on to heal, and in two years' time, those um, pins and nails are absorbed. Therefore, you've eliminated that potential risk for further trauma and obviously further damage to the blood supply and so on. So I think that's the advantage I see mainly over titanium implants and screws. Okay, perfect. Then uh, what is the biggest challenge uh, in, in application regarding the x-ray? As, as you cannot see the implant on x-ray, are, yeah. are there any tips you have? Yeah, so the first, the first thing I would say on that is that um, one of the ways to get really good views of the, of the ankle and the talus if you're operating is to try and move the other leg completely out of the way. So then you have a free run for the C-arm to come in for an AP and a lateral. And the way I do it is I, I basically just bend the other uh, leg out the way, flex at the knee, and then tape it and put a side support. Okay, so that other limb is out of the way. Then your C arm can come in freely, unobstructed by the other normal leg, and you can get perfect views. As for the uh, depth and uh, length of the, the pins, I think this is because you're dealing with direct vision. Yes, there's an element of trusting. Uh, your, your judgment. Obviously, you can use K wires, remember? So, before you insert the 1.5 Activa nails, you pre drill with a K wire and you can pre judge on that and, and, and maybe get an x ray if you're not sure. So, that's one way to do it. And once you're happy with the length on the K wire, you can mark it, take it out, and use that length with the actual implant. So, that's why I would do. I think the important thing is getting good views and you can move that leg out of the way. Perfect. Thank you for these tips. Uh, then, uh, next question. On your view, are the implants easy to insert? Do you have what about the instrumentation? Is it easy or, or difficult? So, I think when I'm performing open surgery like these two cases, I found them very easy to use. Um, what I would say, one important tip, uh, and it's something that I've learned myself, is that to try and put the Activa nail as perpendicular, as 90 degrees as possible to the surface, because if I put them at a slight angle, the head tends to stick out a little bit and it just needs a bit more impaction. 
And if you haven't drilled long enough, then that's a bit of an issue. So I think it's important to try and insert the pins at 90 degrees to the surface that you're, you're fixing. So I think that's one of the tips I learned. In terms of the instrumentation, very easy. I think, um, yeah, it, there's, there's not really a lot to it, but I think pre-drilling is important and then inserting the, uh, the nail. Perfect. The main, main idea is, is, like you mentioned, to get it the surface uh, without any protruding heads of, of the implant. That's, right. so that's yeah. correct. Um, then, which size would you start with? You mentioned that it, the 1.5 is, is the one you go to. Is it mainly yeah. because the location wise or? I think, well, a couple of things. I think the, the, the fracture pattern will often uh, help you. If you have two or three large fragments, then yes, by all means, you can use sli slightly larger implants. But for the two cases that I, I demonstrated, the problem was there was a shear element. So the cartilage wasn't quite stable. There were lots of fragments, lots of small fragments, and it was all very delicate. So in order to try and minimize further trauma, I inserted one of the 1.5 Activa nails and it seemed to work and it looked great. So I thought, well, let's stick with that. Obviously, you can go up to the two millimeter version or even think about the, uh, the screw. But I think this, the screw being 3.5, uh, I think there's a, there's a danger if you have a very small, mainly kind of chondral fracture, like the one with the first case, there was a, a, an anterolateral fragment. It was mainly cartilage. And I, I was just worried about putting anything too big and that will just split that cartilage. So I think it's, it's, it's just, you know, you look at the fracture pattern itself and that will help you decide. But certainly the 1.5s work perfectly, so I didn't see a reason to go up a size. Okay, as as you are a trauma surgeon as well, and your expertise in in these kind of reconstructions, where do you see other indications where where you would use Activa nail? I have used them um, uh, in the uh, pediatric elbow. I have to say that they're pretty useful for those types of fractures. Again, thinking about uh, minimizing further trauma, further surgery. Um, I've used them in capitellum fractures in the pediatric population and in the adult population, and they worked perfect. So I, I think that's one particular uh, good time to use it is around the elbow, where again, you don't want to go back in for re removing metalwork. Um, but for me, obviously being a foot and ankle surgeon, I think they work pretty well around the ankle for osteochondral defects um, and again arthroscopically as you've shown in your video. So yeah, I think the main thing is that you're trying to think ahead on how what would happen if I had to come back. You know, that's that's the main thing. Our time is up at the moment. Thank you very much for the good answers and excellent presentation and uh, nice tips regarding the instrumentation and how to use the implants. Uh, for the viewers, you can see the techniques of Activa Nail and get to know to the indications, check the white papers, see this event as well from our educational material. So dig in there and remember to subscribe to our newsletter so you can get first hand knowledge on next webinar, studies, new products and much, much more about BioReTech. So again, thank you, Mr. Harp, for your time during the presentation. And thank the you presentation. very much, Larry. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Uh, we see you next time on the next webinar. And for now, we say bye-bye and see you again.